Welcome, dear friends of socialmarketing.de. This is uh, our ad online advent calendar and today is the 24th of December. We open our last door and um, I'm happy to welcome a very special guest from UK, London, Mr. Ken Burnett. Hi, Ken. Thank you very much. Hi, hi Jan, and hello, everybody, and uh, Merry Christmas to you all. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to having this chance to talk to you on this very special evening. So. Okay, so great. So, uh, Ken, could you tell us uh, quickly, how did you become a fundraiser? How did you come into this maybe sometimes crazy fundraising world? <laughs> <laughs> well, I came from the publishing world, and I I think like many people I came into fundraising by accident so it wasn't uh, deliberately planned but I was uh, I, and I was 26 years old at the time and I would had been working in the publishing business very hard very cutthroat very high pressure and I was working very late at night and thinking that I'm not doing anything useful I'm not doing anything to make the world a better place so I decided to look for a job and just by chance, a job was advertised in this tiny, tiny organization. It didn't, um, didn't, re didn't really, uh, wasn't known by anybody. Uh, but it was doing good work for children overseas. Okay. And so I applied and I was given the job, which was quite a, a senior job. And I couldn't quite believe that I'd actually got this job. And it, this was this was nearly forty years ago, Jan. So <laughs> a long, long time ago, you wouldn't even be born. Yeah. And, but it, but it, it, in those days, the world was full of opportunity, and nobody was doing professional fundraising. And I had a marketing communications experience from the publishing business, yeah. and so suddenly I found all sorts of opportunities opened up. And the little charity that I work for is now still has been for most of these 40 years, uh, has been um, one of the top 20 fundraising charities in Britain. But it was very tiny when I started. And so this catapulted me into uh, uh, the heart of the emerging fundraising profession and I haven't I haven't gone away I you know I talk to people in fundraising who have been and they say oh, I've been a fundraiser for three years or five years or whatever and I say I started in 1977 so <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of I've got gray haired in fundraising yeah yeah okay. so that's it yeah. okay Thank That's you very much. I started. We want to know from every uh, interview guest in our uh, advent calendar what was their biggest fundraising fail and their funniest fundraising um, moment in okay. 2014. So please, could you share our uh, your your biggest fundraising fail in 2014? Okay, well, because I've been fundraising for such a long time, I've failed more than most people. I have a lot of failures, and I hope I've learned from every failure. Mm -hmm. But this year, I have to say, you know, I, I am on the board of an organization called the Disasters Emergency Committee, okay. which is a coalition of um, 13 different the leading British aid charities. And every time there is a disaster, we, we come together and we raise money from the British public. Mm -hmm. And we're very successful. This year, we have raised, I think, 189 million pounds right. for disasters from the Philippines through to Syria, through Gaza, uh, through for the Ebola crisis, and my failure, and I haven't solved this problem yet, is I have, it's become very clear to me that the British public, and I think this is true in most parts of the world, has a different view of people who are displaced through um, a conflict, mm -hmm like in Syria or like in Gaza, where people are fighting, and where people are displaced through um, a natural disaster, like a typhoon, like in the Philippines, or a disease like Ebola. Mm -hmm. So I have seen from our fundraising with DC that uh, this we are raising about five times more for the victims of a natural disaster, although there's, you know, the, when a family is forced to flee mm -hmm. in the middle of the night because of some impending catastrophe, the humanitarian need is just as great. In fact, often in a conflict, it's even greater, you know, because people are fleeing for their lives because they're, you know, if they stay, they will die. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and then they have faced hostility as refugees. So somehow the failure is that as fundraisers, I think we should be able to address this and we should communicate that people who are faced with a conflict are in every bit as much need and deserve every bit as much. They just don't um, get the same level of public support. And I think that's a task for us fundraisers. We've got to change people's perceptions mm -hmm. so that they help victims of conflict just as willingly as they help victims of of disaster. Yeah. Okay. So that's my failure okay. and I hope I, it's, it's a major issue that I hope to yeah. be working on over the next uh, little while. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So my funny moment, yeah. I mean, <laughs> everything, in, I, I think my funny moment is, is just to show that fundraising really is fun. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have these events we hold in Scotland, which are three days long and they're very intense. And fundraisers come from all over the place to, and you've been on one of these courses, yeah. Uh, and for a while, a couple of months ago, my wife Marie was staying with us okay. while we were running, Alan Clayton and I were running this event. And she said something to me, which I thought was very interesting. She was sitting upstairs and she said, I can hear you guys working at fundraising. And she, and she said, all you seem to do is laugh all day long. <laughs> Don't you ever do any work? And I thought that a that's not fair because obviously we we think we're working very hard. <laughs> she said, "Really, I hear it, and you're just laughing all the time." And it struck me then that this is probably true, mm -hmm. and that what we're doing in our training is a lot of fun, Great. and there is a lot of fun in fundraising. And yeah. so I think that's quite a nice. Uh, little observation and I'd never really realized that we do this but yeah. in fact it's true we do laughing all the it's time very much true very much true that yeah. we do great okay thank you very much and uh, <laughs> how okay. am I doing against the time is this yeah. are we doing all right yeah we are doing all right <laughs> okay I don't want to That's talk perfect yeah and we have a last question because um, we want to know from you, can uh, which is the most important uh, fundraising trend for the next year? So where do we we have to focus on? What do you think? Well, I I would like to. I mean, you obviously gave me a little bit of notice about these questions, and yeah. so I would like to say to you that I think there are four things, mm -hmm. and they're all hugely important in okay. my view. Mm -hmm. But I think the world is changing. The one that is probably the top of my list is donor retention. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the statistics are in Germany, but I think in most countries, keeping donors longer, yeah. Yeah. we all need to, you know, donors cost a lot to acquire. Mm -hmm. We need to make it more pleasant. We need to give them a better experience. My worry is that for most donors, they leave quickly before they've been with us long enough to recover the investment cost, yeah. they are moving on, mm -hmm. they stop supporting us because it hasn't been a, a, a joyful experience, mm -hmm. it hasn't been good enough. Uh, and I think we need to really work at this. And, and so I, I, wrote the, I wrote the introduction to a book by Roger Craver, I don't mm -hmm. know if you've come across it, called Retention Fundraising. Mm -hmm. And uh, really there I was saying this is you know, this is a disgrace in our profession, actually, that we can't keep our customers longer because mm -hmm. we do the best work in the world. Uh, we've got the best of reasons why people should support us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should be able to give. And I think this is about reciprocity. It's about us giving to donors yeah. an experience that they will value and, and enjoy mm -hmm. and feel is worth doing and feel good about so that they will go and tell their friends about it and you know help us to uh, to recruit new donors but yeah. that's not what happens averagely people don't enjoy being a donor and they leave and we need to change this we need to the the, the company i use as a model is amazon mm -hmm. amazon.com <laughs> amazon.co.uk mm -hmm. i'm sure it's amazon.de e or the you know, and no, or uh, at yeah, and nobody or, likes these guys yeah. because they don't pay their taxes mm -hmm. but they give such good service. Mm -hmm. I'm from the publishing background, and it, it, they have taken over the book trade in, in the UK, mm -hmm. and they've stolen it, you know, <laughs> and that was 
small organizations providing a poor service, fragmented, under-investing, mm -hmm. and along came Amazon and they took a long-term view and they developed their products and their service and they're very service-oriented. Yeah. So people, even if they don't like Amazon, mm -hmm. they buy their books from Amazon yeah. and Amazon will be ringing the cash registers <laughs> at the moment selling books left and right because mm -hmm. they give a very, very perfect online experience mm -hmm. and we don't come close to that in terms of customer service okay. so okay. I think we've got to change the experience for donors so that's my number one priority is retention donor retention okay the other thing which I think is very exciting news for fundraisers is I am now part of a commission mm -hmm. for uh, the voluntary sector in the UK looking at, at um, the aging population. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that the older sector, the, 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 the sort of 55 year old yeah. and upwards, people are living longer. I will probably live 10 years or more longer than my parents mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. um, just be demographically, and you are, in this, you are the same, you know, people of your age now will be living to 100 and longer. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. means that people are going to be uh, depending on the state, there's all mm -hmm. sorts of welfare issues, but for at least one third of that group, very important, they are the, aff the most affluent people yeah. in our society, and they're the donors. Mm -hmm. And that group is going to grow. In the UK, it's growing by about 50% mm -hmm. over the next 20 years. And this presents a fantastic opportunity for fundraisers. Yeah. So that is a, a group of people that we should really be looking after because there we could have real growth. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing that I would like to ask you and all German fundraisers, all European fundraisers, fundraisers of the world over, <laughs> is for most of my f working life, I've been quite negative about the corporate sector, corporate mm -hmm. donors. Mm -hmm. It, private individuals give something like 86% 80, of giving in the UK is from private individuals, yeah. individual donors. Corporates are mean, they give about 2, 3, 4%. Mm -hmm. Maybe now that's gone up a bit recently, but at most they're giving about 6%. Yeah. And so I've always said, don't, you know, why focus on corporates? But actually the corporate world is changing. Okay. And people are much less concerned in their companies it's not about hard selling now they're moving towards conversations mm -hmm. it's more about empathy yep. for, for companies and if you look at the very big multinational companies they're they're focusing on telling their stories better mm -hmm. they're engaging customers in a different way and of course corporate world has had very bad press okay. You know, we've had excessive salaries and bonuses and corporate, um, you know, nasty goings on and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the unacceptable face of, of extreme greed, corporate excess, the wolf of Wall Street and all of that kind of thing. And so companies now, I think, are, in, are changing. The, the paradigm is going to change. Mm -hmm. In the next five years, we will see this dramatically. Companies like Unilever, uh, even Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. have taken a lead in this. And some of these companies are, they're like major NGOs. They're like major non-profits. They are actually doing, Goldman Sachs is spending in, on four different program areas. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I, two of them, at least, account for six hundred thousand uh, U.S. dollars of. Um, it's, 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 sorry, six hundred million U.S. Oh, wow. dollars. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think their their corporate philanthropy for that one company is getting yeah. on for a billion mm -hmm. uh, dollars. Now yeah. that makes them as big as the biggest NGOs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These companies can do a great deal, and they can either do it with us our sector, or they can do it without, without us. us yeah. but I, we, we've, we've just done a new course on corporate mm -hmm. uh, fundraising. It's fantastic. Okay. And the, the potential, I think, there 
is really huge. Okay. And then the other thing, am I allowed to make a little plug for my new book? Yes, for sure. Because Why the not? other <laughs> thing, so I just, ha I just yeah. happen to have a copy. Yeah, great. <laughs> and it's called Storytelling Story Can Change the World. <laughs> you know, yeah. And I really believe this. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is the most important work I've done. Okay. Because I believe that the the sales, the mar you know, maybe marketing was a mistake for charities. Mm -hmm. Maybe we became too much of a sales mm -hmm. uh, approach. Sales board, and we okay. should have gone much more for engaging people with the power and passion of our storytelling. Mm -hmm. We've got the best stories in the world to tell, and we've got the best of reasons for telling them. Mm -hmm. And if we tell them well, in a way that will engage people, that will bring them in uh, far more than any hard sales techniques or no uh, smart <laughs> strategies or clever um, marketing devices, yeah. gimmicks and all of that things not at all going to work with people nowadays. Mm -hmm. So telling our stories better is really is the emphasis that I advocate to fundraisers that they have to work at, at how, uh, and as you know, we train people in Scotland to, to do just this. So I think there's a real potential for storytelling. But I, I must say, despite the recession of the last uh, five or six years, mm -hmm. I think that the future for fundraising should be very good. Yeah. But only if we, I think we might need a different kind of fundraiser. We don't want people who are slick, uh, spreadsheet proficient. Mm -hmm. We want people who are sincere, who believe as passionately in the course as the donor does, mm -hmm. and who will get the donor. Donors don't want to deal with flashy salespeople, they yeah. want to deal with people who are really here to change the world. People. And I think our sector, I don't think we should be the not-for-profit sector, that's too negative. Mm -hmm. I think we should be the for-change sector. For change and we should, be leading, mm -hmm. we should be leading the way in mm -hmm. changing the world. Okay. So that would be my Christmas message. Wow. Thank you very much. For all the in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> see, I have my beautiful Christmas tree. Your Christmas tree. tree. <laughs> and yeah. Santa Claus will be coming down the chimney. Okay. Uh, because I've been a good boy all year. Okay, great. <laughs> so, Ken, thank you very much for your Christmas message. And uh, it's always a pleasure, a pleasure to talk to you. And Merry Christmas. Okay, and a Merry Christmas to you and to all of yours and to all fundraisers in Germany. Great. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.